morning, everybody, and welcome to church. We're glad that you're here. We are in week four of our series called Sync. How many of you have learned something over the last three weeks that has been useful to your life? I have learned so much, so thank you. What? Is that better? Okay. Uh, <laughs> I don't remember what I was saying. Thank you to you for pointing out that my pack was sticking out of my shirt and for the great messages over the last few weeks. Um, yeah, I, I think it's been one of my favorite series, a great way to start out the year. So let's check out our verse for this series, Psalm 27, verse 13 and 14 says, I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong and take heart, and wait for the Lord. So we've been talking for the last uh, three weeks now about God's voice, his timing, and his purpose. And so today I want to talk to you about kingdom purpose. What is God's purpose for our lives? I know that for a lot of us, that's kind of a major question that we're constantly asking. It's not just a question that we ask when we're getting ready to graduate high school, although a lot of people do. A lot of people ask it again when they have to choose their major or when they're about to graduate college. But the question of what is my purpose? What in the world have I been put here on planet Earth to do? We want to feel like we're doing something that matters, something that is significant. When we get to the end of our lives, we want to look back and feel like it actually made an impact that we were here. So we tend to spend a lot of our time looking for purpose. We, we look for it in our jobs. We look for it in our uh, school. We look for it in marriage and in parenting. We look for purpose in our relationships. We will spend a lot of our lives running around looking for purpose. And what we're looking for is uh, sometimes this specific thing that says, well, your purpose is to be a dancer. Like, that's my purpose on earth, is to be a dancer. And so I... I'm excited that you're all here today because I'm going to debut my incredible dance skills for you, and that's what we're doing today. So just be prepared for your minds to be blown. Look, you should see the way some of you are looking at me right now. I am so bad at dancing that they actually, when I was a kid, told me, you should stop taking this class. So... That's definitely not my purpose. But that's what we think of purpose as, something very specific, something that is um, unique to, to me, and, and that, that is uh, not really purpose. That's how we live out our purpose. So today, I just want to answer the question for you right off the bat so that we can lay that to rest and be done searching for purpose. Is everybody ready to know here's what your purpose is? Okay, let's look in the Word because if we want to know the answer to a question... We should look in the Word. Revelation chapter 5, verse 9 through 10. And they were all singing this new song of praise to the Lamb. The Lamb is Jesus. And this is in reference to, uh, they're about to sing a song to him about when he came and he gave his life for us. And he died on the cross and then he was buried three days and God raised him from the dead on our behalf. And he went and he's actually in heaven now at the right hand of the Father. And you're going to hear about these scrolls. And the scrolls are what we call the Lamb's Book of Life. It's Jesus' Book of Life where it's got everybody's name written in it that calls him Lord. So they're asking this question. They ask, hey, who's worthy to open these scrolls? And here's what they said. They were all singing this new song of praise to the Lamb. Because you were slaughtered for us, you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals. Your blood was the price paid to redeem us. You purchased us to bring us to God out of every tribe, language, people group, and nation. There's your answer to racism right there. God saved all of us. Jesus came for every one of us, every tribe, every nation, every people group, every language. So we've covered every person on the planet. Well, we haven't. Jesus covered every person on the planet. All right, and now here we go. Here is the answer. There are thousands, literally thousands of books written about how to find this answer. And I'm about to give it to you for free. Okay? If you feel the need to pay for it, that's fine. Just come find me after church. You can Venmo, whatever works for you, all right? But I am offering it for free. So here is the answer to the age-old question, what is my purpose? You have chosen us. That's important to know first and foremost. Jesus has chosen you. Whether you feel like it or not, he has chosen you. But here's the purpose question. You have chosen us to serve our 
God and formed us into a kingdom of priests who reign on the earth. There's your purpose. Serve our God, be a priest who reigns on the earth. And there you go. Your question, your lifelong search for meaning and purpose has been answered. You're welcome. Actually, that would be from Jesus because he's the one who gave us the answer. Serve God, be a priest who reigns on the earth. Now, if you are like me, and I am ashamed to admit this, but if you are like me, when you hear the word reign on the earth, you get a little excited because you think you're going to get to tell people what to do. Like, when you have children, that's one of the greatest benefits <laughs> is you get to tell them to do stuff, like the dishes or the laundry or go make my bed, <laughs> make me dinner. Now, here's the thing. Um, if you are getting into parenting for that reason, don't, because they don't listen. <laughs> Just because you tell them to do it doesn't mean that they're going to. But that, that's not the kind of reigning that we're talking about. We're going to get to there in just a second. But our, we have to really hone in on this first purpose that God gave us. You have chosen us to serve our God. Serving God is the first purpose and the most important purpose of our life. We get very distracted in that pursuit sometimes. Here's the thing. You can settle your purpose and stop questioning it. Don't wake up tomorrow and question what your purpose is. You know you have the answer straight from the mouth of God. Serve God, reign as a priest. Now, how we live out that purpose, that's where God brings each of our unique talents and gifts and abilities and experiences into this thing that's called life so that we can best serve him. But first and foremost... My job, my calling, my purpose is to serve God. Secondly, it is to be a priest who reigns in the earth. We say, well, why, why did he say priest? Because it would make more sense just grammatically for it to be a king who reigns in the earth. I would want to be a queen so that I could have the tiara and access to the shoes and all of that. But he didn't put that in here. He put a priest I don't feel like a priest's wardrobe is as awesome as a queen's wardrobe, first of all. <laughs> Second of all, I don't feel like the uh, priest has quite as much telling people what to do <laughs> as the queen does. But he here's what he did. This word priest here in, in its original form means in the same way serve as Christ was called to serve. He didn't call us. He didn't just say, hey, go reign over people. That's your calling is to reign over people. He said, no, go be like Jesus. Serve God, be like Jesus. If you want to just really simple, what's my purpose? Serve God, be like Jesus. And what did Jesus do? He laid down his life for other people. So my purpose is to first and foremost serve God and then to secondly to serve others. So no matter what I do in this life, my purpose is to serve God and to serve others. Here's where sometimes we get that um, flipped because serving others is way more concrete. Like, you know, okay, when get up in the morning and I'm going to go to a homeless shelter and I'm going to uh, help make food for them. And then that afternoon, I'm going to go to the Pregnancy Resource Center and I'm going to help counsel women who, uh, who are pregnant and aren't sure what to do. And then that night, I'm going to make dinner for my family and I'm going to serve them in that way. It's super concrete to serve other people. Like I can give you a list of a million ways right now you could walk out that door and go serve people. What we do sometimes is because it's a little more uh, tangible and we can grab it, we will put serving others as the foundation of our purpose, the foundation even of our relationship with God. And what he said, that order is important. The Bible does everything for a reason in the way that it did it. And the order here is important. I cannot effectively serve you. I can't serve you in the way that Jesus serves you if I am not serving Jesus first. I might serve you, but it's not going to be in the same way that Jesus served you. I guarantee you somewhere in there will be a little something for me. Whether it's, man, it feels so good to serve other people. You're right, it does. But here, here's what we do. We turn our purpose, and we are, you got to understand, you're created in the image of God. And God's very nature is to serve others. God, I mean, he, he gave the greatest sacrifice there is by Jesus. His nature is to serve. 
And so you're created in that nature. You will find a way to serve. Whether you're like, no, nah, that's not my personality. Somebody serve me. There's going to be something in you that is a drive. You may say, I want to make a difference. What you're saying is, I want to serve. And, and what we will do is we will look for an outlet for our purpose in making a difference. Oh, I want to serve other people. And when we do that, it's called humanitarian aid. And I am not against humanitarian aid, but humanitarian aid without the foundation of Jesus Christ just fills people's stomach, but they're still going to hell. When I am saying, yes, I want to serve you, but it is on the foundation of this vertical relationship with God, that my first thing when I wake up in the morning isn't, how can I serve my husband? How can I serve my kids? Think about it this way. If that's my first thought, I am exhausted at the end of the day. How many of you have had that experience? You, you're serving at your church. You're serving your family. You're serving at your kid's school. You're serving on uh, the student council at your college. You're serving in your uh, fraternity. You're serving at the local homeless shelter. You're serving all of these places. And then you come home at night and you crash and you have found no, uh, no release, no relief. You have found no rest in anything that you're doing because you're out of order. You're trying to put your secondary purpose as your primary purpose. All you got to do is flip it. If you're feeling exhausted, flip it. If you go to bed at night and you're like, I am doing all the right things. Man, I, I, I'm doing everything I can. I, I feel like I'm just servants, give, giving, 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 giving. You can't give what you don't have. And so you can't. I mean, I can serve Michael because I love him. But the greater level is I serve him because God loves him. But I'm not going to understand that until I understand this. And so you've got to look at the order of what God said. First thing is to serve God. When I wake up in the morning, my first thought should not be, God, how can I serve others? That sounds noble. That sounds like what we should be doing. But my first thought has got to be, Jesus, how can I serve you? That verse we read, Psalm 27, it said, wait for the Lord twice. It doesn't mean let's just kick back and eat bonbons till he comes back from, to get us. It means wait like a server, like a, a waiter or a waitress. And one of those that's constantly coming to the table. Not the one that is like, what do you want to drink? And then you see him when it's time for the check. You're one of those that's constantly, hey, what can I do for you? Lord, how can I serve you today? When I wake up in the morning before my feet hit the ground, my thought has got to be, Jesus, how can I best serve you today? He'll tell you. He'll let you in on it if we just ask him the question. And so our purpose is defined in those two things. Serve God, be a priest who reigns on the earth. Now here's what a good priest does. Jesus is called our high priest. And before Jesus came in the Old Testament, in order for someone to get to God or to, to hear from God, to uh, ask a prayer, anything, they had to go through a person, and that was a priest. And so the priest would go into this place. It was called the Holy of Holies. They would enter in. No one else could but them. And that was where the presence of God uh, resided. And so the priest would go in. It would make petitions. He, he would say, you know, hey, this, I want to pray for these people. And then he would bring out the word to the people. Now, when Jesus came, he got rid of the veil that separated us from the Holy of Holies. So don't think of yourself so much in terms of an Old Testament priest. Think of yourself in terms of a New Testament priest like Jesus, who our job is to remove the veil that people keep putting back up. Jesus already took it down. We keep putting it back up. So my job, I, the way that I reign on this earth is to bring, we just sang it, is to ask God to bring heaven to earth. And so here's the thing. Jesus has already said he did that. So now my job is, all right, I wake up, I start serving God immediately. How can I serve you? Thank you for who you are. I'm so honored to be in your presence today. And then everything God puts in my path that day, he is putting it there so I can pull that curtain back for them. He's putting it there so that I can just say to them, hey, let me show you a little bit more of heaven than you know right now. Let me just show you a little bit more because my job as a priest is to help connect you to the Father. And through Jesus, we have the incredible ability to do that. So serve God, serve others. Serve God, serve others. How come we don't live out our kingdom purpose? So if we've settled, that's our purpose. It's done. I don't have to ask questions about it anymore. All finished. How come we don't live out our purpose? I think there's a few reasons. The first one is we don't know. 
We don't know. I don't know how to live out my purpose. I don't know what my purpose is. Now, here's what I want you to understand about this. This one is super key. It sounds very simple. Understand that God's given you every access to everything you ever need to know. He's given you access to everything, every question on earth, every question you'll ever have. He's given you access to answer all of it. It's in the Bible. And a lot of times we don't live out our purpose because we don't love the word. We don't, we don't love the word with this intense, fierce love that says everything I need, I can find in that word. The Bible says in John 1, 1 that, God was, uh, that the word was God and the word with, was with God and God sent the word to us. Jesus is the word. And so we, a lot of times, our relationship, we can't effectively serve God because we don't really know God because we don't know his word. If we want to know God, we have to know his word. We cannot experience one without the other. Here's what you will experience. You will experience an emotionalized relationship with God outside of the word. Now, here's what I mean by that. You come into church on a Sunday morning. You hear someone else tell you what the word of God says. You hear, you engage in some great songs that get you feeling really great about, man, I I love God. It's not that you don't love God. It's just that you don't love him uh, deep in the way that he can be loved because you don't know him yet. Because you're basing your relationship on my relationship or on your pastor's relationship, or on uh, some, somebody on Instagram's relationship, or on some song that makes you feel great. But here's what happens. If your relationship with God is not based on the word of God, then your emotions at some point will dry up. Your emotions about how you feel about God will change. And it's not uh, a bad thing. God does that. <laughs> He's trying to draw you deeper into himself. Because your emotions are not the the foundation of our relationship with God. It feels great. I mean, like, listen, this morning in worship, I was feeling awesome. I love the way that feels. I love the way the music makes me feel. God designed music. He's trying to elicit an emotional response from you. I love when, I, when, I, when I'm uh, hanging out with my Christian friends and we're getting all jazzed up about everything God's been doing. I love all of that. But that cannot be the only way that I know God. Because if it is, then I will not know him truly. And in order to live out my purpose, in order to first serve God so that I can be a kingdom priest, I have got to know him truly. And here's the great thing about the word. I'm a reader. I love reading. I will read two to three books a week if I didn't have a job and husband and kids. I mean, I love having you guys around. But if you weren't, I'd read a lot more. I love reading all kinds of books. I actually collect old books just because I love the idea of how many different people have read this book and how many hands has this been through and what kind of lives were changed through this book. My, one of my favorite books is Little Women. I read it almost every year. And I love that book. I mean, I set aside time to read it and I learn things from it. But here's the difference in reading Little Women and reading, and reading the Word of God. Little Women has never spoken back to me. Little Women has never been an advisor. It's never been, none of the characters and the pages of Little Women have actually come and sat with me and walked me through grief or walked me through trial. That's never happened. The word of God isn't just something that we love. The word of God loves us back. And when you enter into that uh, reciprocating relationship with the word of God, everything changes. All of a sudden, you know him at a deeper level, and you know that he knows you at a deeper level than you thought. So if you don't know, get in the Word. Jump in the Word of God. Number two reason we don't is we get distracted. We live in a shiny world, you guys. And I don't know, have you guys ever seen Cats? Not the movie. I heard that was weird. But the, <laughs> the uh, I do love the musical, though. The, uh, like, actual Cats. And, and if they're in a room and then a light is shining somewhere, like a little, have you guys ever watched what they do? Yes or no? Okay. Uh, how about Finding Nemo and Dory, the little blue fish? Okay. Shiny things distract us. 
We live in a world of shiny things. And, and we can wake up in the morning and be like, man, I'm going to be living on purpose today. I'm going to serve God, and I'm going to bring heaven to earth for somebody else. And then like, ooh, squirrel. <laughs> we just get super distracted. And one of the ways we get distracted is we, uh, <laughs> we put so much significance on decisions that we think define our purpose. So, for instance, uh, which job should I take? Got job A, I got job B. Which major should I declare? Do I want to be a psych major? Do I want to be a pre-med? Um, you've got these decisions that we turn into eternal decisions. And here's one of the ways that we can keep ourselves from being distracted is do not place eternal significance on temporary circumstances. My career is temporary. My, had the number of kids I have is temporary. The uh, major I declare is temporary. Here's what you have to look at all of it is. It's just a vehicle for God to live out his purpose through me. So whether I choose job A or job B, as long as they both honor God, he's going to live his purpose out. So my question isn't, oh God, I mean, I've watched people and I've done it where you get stuck in this circle of indecision and it's not like the waiting circle we talked about last week. This is just a holding pattern that God didn't put you in that we put ourselves in because we don't want to make the wrong decision. And we think, well, if I choose to, to be pre-med, well, what if that doesn't honor God and I don't want to mess that up? So maybe I should be early childhood education, but I hate kids, but, but maybe that's what God's calling me to. And well, maybe I should be, uh, uh, you know, a psych major, but people get on my last nerve you know we we get ourselves in these states of well if I have three kids is that more honoring to God than if I have 10 kids well you need to know your capacity for kids I cannot have 10 kids I mean if God told me to okay but for those of you who do I want you to know I pray for you on the hour that is a lot of children and I know people are like, oh, it's just more arrows in my quiver. That's in the Bible about how every child is an arrow in your quiver. I'm like, my quiver is smaller than yours. <laughs> but we get stuck in these cycles of indecision. And God the whole time is just going, hey, Amy, take a breath. A or B doesn't matter because I'm bigger than the whole alphabet. So let's just get moving and let me live out my purpose through you. It's not that big of a deal. We turn them into mountains. Now listen, do not run under the bush with this. Well, Pastor Amy said it doesn't matter what choice I make. So today I'm going to rob a bank. <laughs> that does not honor God. And yes, he's bigger than your bank robbing and he'll redeem you, but don't plan it. <laughs> like, just stop it. Don't sin. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about life decisions when you really want to honor God. Here's something that helps me decision making. If I have two equally valid choices in my life, the question is always, how can I affect more people for the kingdom? Through which of these decisions will I, if I, if I live here, God, how many people can I affect for the kingdom? How many people will go to heaven because I live here? If I live here, how many people will go to heaven? And it's as simple as that. Because here's the thing, just understand God, God's much bigger than our temporary viewpoint. And last week, Michael talked about when we're in that circle, sometimes it's just God trying to elevate our perspective. So step back, take a breath. Don't get stuck in indecision. Number three, we get tired. Here's why we get tired, because consistently leading a life of purpose is hard work. Stability, creating a life of stability takes hard work. It doesn't just happen. God's not just going to, like, Sprinkle pixie dust on your life, and all of a sudden everything's stable. No, he, he gave you everything you need, and now he's saying, hey, just pick it up and walk with it. But the walking requires work, so sometimes we just get tired. I don't want to live out my purpose today. I lived it out yesterday. Today I just want a Netflix in the bed. <laughs> don't quit because you get tired. If, again, if you're tired, check your order. Who, who am I serving first? Am I trying to serve without sitting at the feet of the master? Here's the thing. When I'm serving others, it's very different than when I serve God. Serving God looks like yes, sir. Honestly. It's pleasure. It's a relationship. 
serving God is like sitting with your best friend and, and the world's greatest father all rolled into one. But at the end of the day, he bought me. I'm his. The Bible says it's no longer I, live, I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So decision making is, is pretty simple because it's, yes, sir. That's not how I serve him. He's not God. You know, I, I don't serve Bobby by saying, well, just whatever you want, that's what I'll do. No, that, that's not called serving. That's called slavery. And so God hasn't called us to be a slave to one another in that way. He has called us to lay down our life and be willing to die for one another. He's, he's absolutely given us the ability to say, I can see you now because first and foremost, I'm seeing him for he, who he is. I can now see you for who you are. And when I see you the way that God sees you, of course, I'd lay down my life for you. He did it. Why wouldn't I? Number four, it gets hard. Sometimes we get tired and then it can get hard. Laying down your life for other people can hurt sometimes. It's not always fun when you're laying down your life, but they're not doing it for you. It can, get, it can hurt. It can hurt sometimes living out your purpose means sacrificing. It means being willing to say no to certain things that you really want to say yes to because that's not the purpose God has for me. Serving you can sometimes look like denying me. Not sometimes, all the time. Serving God will always look like denying me. Serving you will look like denying me. And denying me sometimes hurts. Sometimes I just want to do what I want to do. And I don't care what you say. But I always ask myself the question, what if Jesus had that mindset? What if he came to, to earth? I, I imagine going to the cross hurt. And what if he looked at us and he was like, I don't care what you say. I don't care that you're never going to get to know me. I don't care that you're never going to get to experience the fullness of God in your life. I just want to do what I want to do because this is hard and it hurts. Like, that's just not who he is. And I understand he's Jesus. Listen, I get it. We all are working towards that. None of us are there. But as I continue to serve God, he shows me who he is in his word, and I have more and more access to be like him. Ultimately, Again, serve God, and what we're saying is be like Jesus. And you're like, yeah, thanks. That's not a huge, lofty goal at all. It's really hard. I know. I'm there with you. But he wouldn't have told us to do it if we couldn't. He wouldn't have said this is who you are if it wasn't who we are. He made us in his image. Now the decision for us is simply am I going to die to self and live for him? That, that's purpose, every single day deciding that. So there's the reasons we don't live out our kingdom purpose. How do we live out our kingdom purpose? We know now, okay, watch for these things, but what do we do? Let's look at Malachi chapter 3, 1 through 3. This, this, this uh, scripture here is all about Jesus. This is all about who he is. It says, look, I'm sending down my messenger, who is Jesus, on ahead to clear the way for me. Suddenly, out of the blue, the leader you've been looking for will enter his temple. Yes, the messenger of the covenant, the one you've been waiting for, look, he's on his way. A message from the mouth of God of the angel armies. And here's the question we ask ourselves, but who will be able to stand up to that coming? Who can survive his appearance? That's kingdom purpose. Is at the end of the day, being able to say, yeah, I, I, I can stand up. I can do that. Who will be able to stand up to that coming? Who can survive his appearance? He'll be like white hot fire from the smelter's furnace, and a smelter is a purifier of gold. He'll be like the strongest lye soap at the laundry. He'll take his place as a refiner of silver, as a cleanser of dirty clothes. And you remember the first verse we read said that we're what? Priests. He's called us to serve God and to reign as priests. Here's the answer. How do we do this? He'll scrub the Levite priests, that's you and I, clean. He'll refine us like gold and silver until we're fit for God, fit to present offerings of righteousness. He will scrub us clean. He will refine us. How do we live out kingdom purpose? Accept the covering of our priest, Jesus. We can't do it outside of him. 
He's the one who already did the work. He made the sacrifice. You understand, he, he made the sacrifice. Sure, I'm going to make sacrifices along the way. But in comparison, let's just look at this from our point of view for a second. You have the Savior of the world, the King of the universe, Jesus, who has laid down his very life. I come in and I say, okay, I'm, I'm going to lay down this friendship. I know Jesus laid down his life, but I'm going to lay down this friendship. So that means that people can be saved. That is not how that works. My sacrifices will not lead to people's salvation. What my sacrifice does is get myself out of the way so that I can be a receiver and a presenter of the sacrifice of Jesus. It is not about me. It is not about how good or how bad I am. It's not about how many times I get up and say, I'm, I'm going to live for Jesus today. It is about what he already did. And there is no undoing what he already did. My job is just to stand and say, first and foremost, I receive the sacrifice that Jesus made. And second, now I just want to present that sacrifice to the world. That's it. I receive it. I present it. If I haven't received it, I can't present it. You cannot give something that you don't yet have. So the first thing we've got to do, and you have to do this. This isn't just a one time. This isn't about getting saved. Yes, you need to accept Jesus as your Savior. But once we've done that, we have to continually put ourselves back under his covering because we get distracted. We wander out from under it, and we have to continually say, uh, seriously, if you are exhausted, if you are tired, if you feel like, um, what are those, a hamster in a wheel, you need to find, whose covering are you under right now? Because the, the covering that God provides is like shade. He, he talks about how he makes us to lie down in green pastures. He is the shelter, the most high. He is our fortress. If you're not experiencing that, then you've stepped out from the covering. And so it's just a simple recognizing, oh, okay, I need to get back under the covering of my priest. We cannot make it to our heavenly father were it not for Jesus. When God looks at us, he sees us through the filter of Jesus, thank God. Because no matter how many sacrifices we make, we will not make it without him. So first, you wanna live out your purpose? Accept the covering of our priest. Second, it says there in Malachi 3, 2, we just read, this is a different translation. He will be like a blazing fire that refines metal or like a strong soap that bleaches clothes. We have to allow the refiner's fire to do its job. And here's the thing. When I say fire, a lot of us in this room are like, uh-uh, I'm out. And it's not because we don't want to honor God. It's because we think the fire... The refiner's fire is like a, a blazing wildfire out of control with no concern for who it destroys. Life, death, none of that matters. Just a blazing out of control fire. That's not a refiner's fire. That is not our God. That is not how he grows us. If you're standing in the middle of an out of control furnace, you need to step out of it and get back under the covering of your priest because that's not how he works. He works as a refiner. And he, here's, here's how gold is refined. They take a lump of gold. It doesn't look like what you think it does, but it, it's just a big lump. And it's got all of decades and centuries worth of garbage. And they call it dross in it. And it's because you think about it, it's, it's been sitting in, the, in the, the rocks and the mine for all of that time. So it collects a bunch of stuff on it. And they have to purify it. So the way that they do that is through fire. And it's called a refiner. And the, and the refiner takes the gold and he puts it into the fire. Now, the refiner knows exactly what temperature that fire needs to be and for how long that gold needs to be in there. It's not like, let's just throw it in the fireplace and see what happens. No, he's already, he knows this, this piece of gold weighs this much, which means I need to set the fire to this temperature for this long. He puts the fire down in it, and as the fire starts doing its job, the gold sinks to the bottom, it liquefies and goes to the bottom, and all of the, the grossness rises to the top. And then the refiner is able just to simply take, take his tool, and he just gets all of the gross off of the top. And what you have left at the end of all of that is this pure piece of gold. Now, I learned this this week. The gold 
100% pure gold is not like this. It's not hard. It can't be molded. It's too soft. And here's, here's what I think we can learn. Because he in the Bible several times calls himself the refiner and, and references refiner's fire. I think you need to understand that God is our refiner. And he sees you from the, he sees your, your end from the very beginning. And he, he's never going to have you walk this process by yourself. But he's going he's gonna to pick us with all of our dirt and with all of our grossness but he's not gonna leave us that way because he sees the end. He sees the beauty that we can become. And so he's gotta take us through the process to get us to be able to live our purpose. And so he's going to take us. The difference in our refiner is he does the refining in his hands. And sure, sometimes it's gonna feel hot and it's gonna feel like this is uncomfortable and I gotta grow. And I was a little more attached to that grossness than I thought I was, so ouch when you pull it out. But here's what it looks like. He is your refiner. He knows exactly how much fire. He knows exactly how long. He knows exactly what you need to get you to the place that he designed you to be. Don't jump out of his hands. Do not jump out of the fire before it is time because here's what happens to gold that gets out of the fire before it's time. It is never pure. It will never be the kind of gold that it could be. And it becomes uh, very easily moldable by outside sources. So here's what I think God is saying to us. He's trying to get us to a place where we are so soft in his hand that this world cannot mold us into what they think we should be. That this world can't take the purpose of God inside of us and turn it and twist it into something else because it just falls through their fingers because we weren't designed to live in this world's hand. We were designed to live in the hands of our refiner. And as we do that, he will shape us into exactly what he wants us to be. And every day is a shaping process. I, I, I can't tell you that it ends. You know when it ends? when we see him face to face and we become like him. But until then, we are in the refiner's hands. He is gonna continue to mold us so that we can live out our purpose. Someone is is depending on you staying in that refiner's fire. They need you to be who God called you to be so that they can be who God called them to be. And then the third thing, keep your eyes on Jesus. Just, I know we said stay under his covering, but when you're in his hands and you're starting to feel the the weight and some of the heat of change, (laughs) keep your eyes on him. Keep your eyes on your refiner. Because I promise when you look in his eyes, here's what you're going to see. It's in Hebrews chapter 12. We look away from the natural realm and we fasten our gaze onto Jesus who birthed faith within us and who leads us forward into faith's perfection. His example is this, because his heart was focused on the joy of knowing that you would be his, he endured the agony of the cross and conquered its humiliation and now sits exalted at the right hand of the throne of God. So consider carefully, when you're wanting to jump out of the refiner's hand, consider carefully how Jesus faced such intense opposition so that you won't become worn down and cave in under life's pressures. After all, you have not yet reached the point of sweating blood in your opposition to sin. And have you forgotten his encouraging words spoken to you as his children? He said, my child, don't underestimate the value of the discipline and training of the Lord God or get depressed when he has to correct you. For the Lord's training of your life is the evidence of his faithful love. And when he draws you to himself, it proves you are his delightful child. When you're ready to jump out of those hands, just look in his eyes and remind yourself the fact that he is growing me proves I'm his delightful child. The fact that he won't let me just say a misshapen lump of dirt and and grossness proves that I am his delightful child. Stay focused on his face. Stay under his covering and don't jump out of the fire. Stay there with him. I promise you the end is worth it. And here's the beauty about life is we get here and he takes us to the next place. And he says, hey, you did great. Daughter, son, you did an amazing job. Let's let's jump over here now. 
I got, I got, it's time to refine a little more right here. And every time he refines you, it's for a purpose. Every time he brings that fire, it is for a reason. And somebody somewhere needs us to be able to be soft in his hands so that when we walk by the person on the street that nobody else will look at, we stop and we get down on our knees with them and we say, what's your name? Tell me your story. That when we walk by the prisons, we don't just see hopeless people and think, well, we're glad they're there. That we're so soft in the hands of our God that he allows it to break our heart so that we can say, God, I wanna serve you today and you walked me by this place. How can I serve them? He's called us to serve him and to be a priest in this world. We're called to serve others. So the question today is, how do we live that out? And what God put in front of you when you leave here today, how can you serve him and how can you serve others? Ask him every step of the way. God, how can I serve you? When I'm standing in line at Publix and the lady in front of me doesn't have enough money to pay her groceries, I can get agitated or I can go, God, thank you for the opportunity to serve you. I'm about to live out my purpose. Whether or not I can pay for her groceries is not the purpose. The purpose is, do I see her? Am I willing to live out my purpose at all times? And it just starts with serving God. So bow your heads, close your eyes. Maybe you've never served God before. Maybe you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord so you don't really know how to live out your purpose yet. Your very thing you were designed for was to be his. And he's here today. He wants to meet you. He knows you. Man, he knows you inside and out. He wants you to know him. And the Bible says that if we believe in our hearts and we confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord, then we are saved. We belong to him. And we're going to give you that opportunity. So today, whether you've never asked Jesus into your heart, or maybe you've asked him, but you've walked away and you're ready to come back, I want to pray with you. We're not going to have you come up front or say anything, or we're not going to point you out. Everybody's eyes are closed, but I just want to know that I'm praying with you. So today, if you want to jump into the hands of Jesus for the first time, or you're ready to come back home to him, just lift your hand so that I know that we're praying together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're just jumping into the safety of Jesus. Here's the beauty is he's right there. (laughs) This isn't something you have to take another step for. You don't have to go earn it. And we can't. But the moment you turned your eyes to him, he was already looking at you. He's already got you in his hands. So we're just going to say this prayer as an outward sign of what Jesus has already done in your heart. I want everybody to say this after me. Dear Jesus, thank you for saving me. I ask you to be mine. I give myself to you. I receive your forgiveness and your power to walk forward. Thank you for holding me in your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Why don't you guys stand up? Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take a moment. We're just gonna respond to God. He told me two specific things today that he wants us to respond about. Number one is if you have if you have jumped out of the fire prematurely, if you said it was too hard or you didn't like it or you didn't wanna do it anymore, man, it's okay. Now we just turn back around and jump in his hands. So today, maybe you need to jump back in his hands. Number two, maybe you've never asked him. Maybe you've never said to him, hey, I want you to refine me. And listen, I know that's a bold.